fart. Get it? Is this side infected? So we are going to draw the heart. We are going to go through the blood pathway because we we did that though already. Huh? You just want to know the highlighting, huh? All right. How about this? You were there Tuesday when we did the heart, correct? Correct. These are the pointers in which he gave me that are on the test. So what I want to do is go over, let's go over a lot of the pointers, but not all of them. We'll go over the first page, and then we'll save the second page for next week, because your test is when, right? For meningitis, no, that they can't It's not next week, it's the following week. So we still have next week, and then we'll cover the second page. Okay? Okay. Um, are we expecting a lot of people, like is Judy L coming, is Ivan coming? <laughs> Ivan Mike? Okay. Stop. Sign him in on the list for me. Okay? Um, but if you haven't heard from anybody else, don't sign them in. But I'll let you sign him in because I know he works. Okay? And then that's about it. Then we'll start with this. Okay. First bullet. What is ejection fraction? Okay? Ejection fraction, it needs to go as follows. We kind of covered it already. This is the amount of blood that gets pushed out. 60% is normal function. When I get it. The moment we hit 40%, we're already in moderate heart failure. I get it when you think it. Lower than 20%. We need a heart transplant. So this is where the ejection fraction comes in. If the heart itself is here or below, it means we're not pushing enough oxygenated blood out to the body. So we're at risk for heart failure. The moment it hits 40%, we have heart failure. That's going to be the question. Okay? What is the percentage that means we have heart failure? 40%. Okay? Now, we have to go over cardiac output and stroke <coughs> volume. Good thing is they're together. Cardiac output is the product of heart rate times stroke volume. So, cardiac output is the amount of blood pushed out per minute. Minute is my trigger word. Where stroke volume is the amount of blood pushed out per beat times whatever the heart rate is, and that's what my cardiac output should be. Okay? Now, we have something that's known as the pulse deficit. The pulse deficit we learned how to do in term one. The pulse deficit is when we have two nurses who have to take pulses. One nurse will take the apical pulse rate. Where is the apical pulse rate? It's located over the apex of the heart, and this is for a full minute. We then will take the radial pulse. Once we get the radial pulse, say the epical pulse is 100 beats. The radial pulse is 96 beats. We minus the two and we get the pulse deficit of four beats per minute. So, if it's ever greater than four, we have arterial blockage somewhere in our body. Whether it be in an artery going to this arm or to this arm, there's some form of plaque developing and that's why we have a pulse deficit. Now we have the active phase of the heart and the resting phase of the heart. So, systole, heart at work. 
diastole, heart at rest. That's why it's always S over D. Then we have A systole. What does that mean? A means the absence and systole means of contraction. So when we have a patient who is asystole, we have a patient that does not have a pulse. So this is an emergency situation. We either have to start CPR or our patient is dead. Okay? When we get to the word old urea, the body has to put out at least 720 ml of urine a day. A minimum of 30 ml per hour. If it doesn't, we then start getting into either we're dehydrated or we may have kidney failure. Old urea means the body is putting out 500 or less ml in 24 hours. So this is the body's defense. This is how we keep in more fluid if we have hemorrhage, if we're dehydrated, if we start to go into shock, our body will hold in water, and that's why we get into old urea. Okay. Now, the next one is when a patient complains of chest pain, another word for chest pain, angina. Okay, that is chest pain, angina. If they start having chest pain, the first thing to do, this is why it's in two forms. You make the patient stop. You sit them down and you tell them to rest. If the pain persists, if it continues, we then go into our nitroglycin protocol, which is what? We then will administer one tab every five minutes with a max of three tabs in 15 minutes. This is how we do it. We put the nitroglycerin tablet sublingual. We wait five minutes, we ask the patient, on a scale of zero to 10, what is your pain level? I'm still out of six. I administer the second dose of nitroglycerin sublingually. I wait five minutes. I ask him again. On a scale of zero to 10, what is your pain level? He still tells me I'm at a five. I will then administer the last nitroglycerin tablet sublingually, wait five minutes and ask, are you still in pain? If he says yes, I'm already on the phone, 911 emergency. I have a patient and they're going into MI. I've already administered the three tablets of nitroglycerin and angina is still present. Get here fast. Because you got about five minutes and then they're gonna have a heart attack on you, okay? So that's what we have to do. So what is my nitroglycerin protocol? Three tabs in 15 minutes, okay? Five minutes apart. All right, now, first priority for MI. This is how we treat MIs. We first will administer oxygen immediately through nasal cannula. As nurses, we're allowed to administer two liters per minute without a doctor's order. We then, if we're licensed, will start an IV site and they immediately start getting morphine sulfate through IV to reduce the pain and anxiety associated with the heart attack, okay? Then, before they even leave the hospital, they're gonna have an RN come in and tell them, you have a strict diet to follow. You're gonna be on a sodium restricted diet as well as you are not allowed to do any form of exercise for the next couple of weeks because you'll have a heart attack again if you stress the heart, okay? 
Also, they will tell you, you are not allowed to eat three large meals. You have to eat five to six small meals a day. When you eat large meals, you increase the workload of the heart. So you have to eat five to six small meals to decrease the workload of the heart, all right? And that's all discharge planning for a patient who had an MI. Will an eraser work on that? Do you have to do it? Why? Just because it's a smart board, and technically we're not supposed to be using Expo markers. Oh. But the school just buys Expo markers, so. that because potassium is the main electrolyte that does the electricity of the heart. Without the potassium, the heart itself will not have the SAAB bundle of his Purkinje fibers. chamber of the heart where we measure central venous pressure? The right atrium. When central venous pressure is high, we will have JVD, known as jugular vein distension, because we have what type of heart failure? We have right-sided heart failure. Right-sided heart failure means we have systemic signs. We have anasarca, which means all over body edema. We have JVD, which means jugular vein distension. When it comes to left-sided heart failure, it's all pulmonary. We have pulmonary edema, meaning we have frothy sputum, blood-tinged sputum. We have pulmonary congestion, we have shortness of breath, we have dyspnea, that means left-sided. If it has anything to do with breathing or lungs, it's always left-sided. And that is the first side that we start heart failure on. Then once it goes from left-sided, it will then develop into right-sided, and right-sided heart failure is all our systemic anasarca, edema, ascites, JVD, hepatomegaly. hepatomegaly, okay, splenomegaly. Okay, CHF results to ventricular failure. Left-sided heart failure is more common, which is manifested by pulmonary symptoms. That's what I just told you, okay? Uh, what are the nursing interventions for CHF heart failure? Position, diet, weight measurement. This is what you guys need to know. When they have CHF, they're always in a high phallus. Because if we lie them down flat, they will drown to death in all of their excess fluid, okay? When it comes to diet, they're always on sodium restriction. And we need small meals. Why? To decrease the workload of the heart. Then, when it comes to weight measurement, we are going to do daily weights. We do it same time. 
same scale, same clothes. Every pound, every pound gain is actually 2.2 .2 pounds of water. That's what we're looking for. We're seeing how many pounds of water they're, they're holding in because that's what CHF is. It's all about fluid retention. Okay, now we're on cardiac catheterizations. When it comes to cardiac catheterizations, we actually do a puncture site down here in our femoral artery, okay, or femoral vein. We put in a little camera, then we let the blood take it back up to the heart. So, status post, meaning after cardiac catheterization, these are my nursing interventions. I have to put a pressure dressing on the site. I then will put a 20 pound sandbag on that leg because they will bleed out if I don't put pressure on it. I will continuously monitor for any type of bleeding, even bleeding that's pulling to the rear because if they're laying down, it's going to pull on the back side. So I actually have to roll them a little bit to make sure it's not bleeding. And I will always check the pulse site distal to the heart or cardiac catheterization. So I'm always looking at the dorsalis pedius pulse site to make sure that there's still a pulse there. Because if there isn't, then that means the sandbag is cutting off the circulation. Okay? Um, signs and symptoms of digoxin toxicity. And what are the therapeutic ranges? What's up? Um, I have one for you. That one? Yep, yep. And there's another something for you. Oh, yeah. It's okay, Chester. Are you two different ones? Huh? Oh, no, they're just in here. I already did that. Okay. Um, where's the seat? Yes, I'm just going. I don't feel Okay. Okay. I'm ready to All right. So, the dachshund toxicity. This is where we see yellow rings around the lights. What's normal range? 0 0.5 to 5. 0 0.5 to 2.0 decibels. Or was it decigraph per liter or deciliter or something like that? It's just 0. 0.5 to 2.0. To 2.0, yep. Um, what is Hohmann signs? Hohmann signs can either be positive or negative. Positive for Hohmann signs. Which means we are positive for a DVT. This is how it will be described. <coughs> Upon assessment, the nurse dorsiflex the foot and the patient screams out in pain. What does that mean? That means the patient is positive for home signs, which means they have a deep vein thrombus located within their calf muscle, okay? So, he could take it two ways. How do we perform home inside? What you just heard me say. The nurse will dorsiflex the foot and the patient will scream out in pain because they're positive for home inside. Or it will say, the nurse has assessed and has decided that the patient has a DVT. What does this mean? And you have to pick positive for home in signs. Okay? All right. Why do home in signs occur? Because the patient had a heart attack. The patient had surgery. And now they're just laying in this bed. They're not walking. The blood will pull in the tap muscles 
if we don't use anti-embolic stockings. Those stockings that are pressurized, they go shh, shh, shh. Head toes are different than anti-embolic. Anti-embolic stockings are actually hooked up to a machine and they're a mechanic. They're like pressure booties. They're like space boots. They put them on you and they close up and then they release and then they close up because that forces the blood to come back to the heart. Where Ted's toes are like pantyhose that you put on and as you're walking, it makes the blood continuously flow up and down. So that one's not mechanically. Mm -hmm. One's like Ted hose is pantyhose and anti-embolic stockings are space boots. <laughs> all right. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So, what are anticoagulants? We already know we have a couple anticoagulants. All right. We have very common ones. Heparin. Given IV and sub Q. Always looking for the APTT test, and it has an antagonist, protein sulfate. Then we have lobinox. It's a light strand heparin. Its diagnostic test is going to be a CBC because this is going to tell us about the platelet count in the body. Antagonist, same for Lobinox and heparin. Then we have an oral. Lobinox is always IV and sub-Q also. We have an oral route known as warfin and coumadin. Diagnostic test for this one is PT and INR. PT is all about my clotting time. The normal time is 11 to 12.5 seconds. When they're on warfarin or Coumadin, it can go up to 24 seconds. If this becomes toxic, the antagonist is vitamin K. When it comes to all three of these, there are some signs and symptoms that they're becoming toxic. They all mean we're bleeding. We have hematemesis, hematuria, ecchymosis, petechiae, Pura, all forms of bruising, epistaxis, mm. melina, hematchesia. All of these mean that we are bleeding, okay? All of them. So if we're bleeding, they're toxic. That's what we need to know. And if they're toxic, we use the antagonist. We also will teach our patients who are on oral anticoagulants to avoid eating dark, green, leafy veggies because those are the ones that contain high amounts of vitamin K. The reason we take these, we don't want clots. Our blood is prone for clots. We already had a CVA. We already had a heart attack. We already had a blood clot, a DVT. So we know our blood is prone for clots and we have to keep them from forming because if we don't, then we will have another stroke. We'll have another heart attack and we may die this time. When it comes to fibrinolytics, the ending lytics means it dissolves or destroys. The word fibrin is a clot. It's actually the mesh, net, the mesh network that forms the clot. 
So if we see something that says fibrinolytic, what type of medication is that? It's a medication that destroys or dissolves the blood clot. Okay, that's all he wants to know. When we have an MI, known as what? Infarction. There are going to be two enzymes present in our blood that indicate we have the heart attack. CKMB, creatinine kinase. Oh, I said B. It's B. And then troponin 1. These are the indicators that, yes, the patient had a heart attack. So these are blood indicators. There's one more. It's an elevated ESR. And this is the definite indicator that the patient had a heart attack. But without these two being present, they will never check for that. Okay? The major complication of a heart attack is what? Life-threatening dysrhythmias because our heart is not beating properly. There's a, par a point in it that is ischemic, which means it lacks oxygen. Once we lack oxygen, we become necrotic. That means tissue is dying. Once tissue begins to die, our heart stops beating or it'll quiver. When it comes to high cholesterol and low cholesterol, remember that HDL and LDL? Yeah, that's all about cholesterol. Cynthia? Huh? <laughs> the potassium is very diuretic. We have di diuretics. <laughs> I'm like, oh. 
Diuretics decrease fluid. And when we decrease fluid, we lower our blood pressure. So we usually have diuretics in with our hypertension medicines. There are some that are known as potassium sparing. These are the ones we want to use when we have heart problems because the reason we have heart problems is because we're pushing out too much potassium. So we can't use Lasix on these people. So we actually have MAD. <laughs> Madrill, Adapton, Damadril, and uh, what is it, Diridium? Mad. These are all the potassium sparing diuretics that we have. Everything else is potassium waste. So, we give these when what? When the body is pushing out too much potassium. We give these. Now, when the body is holding in potassium, we want to give potassium wasting diuretics. There's one major one. Lasik, also known as porosamide. Okay? This is the number one potassium wasting diuretic. So if their body is holding in potassium, we give them this one. Because remember, we have to have potassium at normal ranges or else our heart is all out of whack. Okay? What's the normal range? 3.5 to 5.0. We're gonna be asked that repeatedly. Um, we're going to get a question that says, how do we store nitroglycerin tablets? One, they need to be in a dark colored bottle. They are only good for three to six months. After that, we need to discard them and get a new order. And we avoid moisture and heat, so we never keep them in the bathroom. Never. For patients on low sodium diets, you tell them to use the DASH diet. Do you guys remember Mrs. Dash? My grandfather was on this. The seasoning Mrs. Dash, it's all about lemon juice and pepper. Lemon juice and pepper, because they're not allowed sodium. And we all know that salt is what gives us that flavor, but we're not allowed it. So we tell them to use lemon juice and pepper and that will help with their diet because it has to be bland. If they have sodium in their diet, they're gonna have a heart attack on us. What is Dash stand for? Huh? What is Dash stand for? Mrs. Dash. Oh, okay. It's just the seasoning. Yeah, that's why we call it the Dash diet. Because the doctors are like, oh, you just gotta go on the Dash diet. What do you mean? You go to the store and you buy Mrs. Dash. It's all lemon juice and pepper. Yeah, I used to hate no, I used to be like, no, give me salt. And I want lorries. I don't want no regular salt. I want seasoning salt. You don't tell them about the foods high in potassium? Crowder? The foods high in potassium? Crowder. Cantaloupe, orange, watermelon, oh. raisins, oh, and Oh, that's what I missed your banana. Okay, banana too. Um, so baked potatoes. Asparagus and apricots. Okay, so when it comes to foods high in potassium, you'll probably get into it more when it comes into fluid and electrolytes. But there are foods that are high in potassium. This is how I remember them. Crowd. Cantaloupe. Raisins. Oranges. Watermelon. Dates. Here's some other stuff. Baked potato, not fried. Baked, okay? Asparagus. 
Even though it makes your pee smell bad, it's good for you. And apricots. Oh, as well as, you know, your, your friend bananas. Kiwis. I was just about to say, and kiwis. When hypertension is a chronic condition, we <coughs> teach the patient, even though you're starting to control your hypertension and you're starting to feel better, in no way can you stop your hypertensive meds because you will have rebound hypertension and you'll have a stroke. What is the blood pressure that means you are hypertensive? One forty over ninety means you have hypertension. Pre hypertensive, one thirty five over eighty five, or it could be one thirty, anywhere from here to there. Okay, that's pre. But once you hit 140 over 90, you are hypertensive and you're at risk for aneurysm or stroke. Remember why I told you we have angina? Because it's due to ischemia. What does ischemia mean? means lack of oxygenation to the myocardium. So why do we have angina? Because we don't have any oxygen in the heart. If a patient has a DVT, which is a blood clot, are you allowed to massage the area? No. So when you're giving a bed bath, you will pat dry, not rub, pat dry. Okay, signs and symptoms of shock. Remember, what are the first, what's the first tier of shock? What did I say? You got it. the pressure. Restlessness? No, that's second. We'll do it. Okay. First tier is agitation and restlessness. Meaning they just don't know why they can't get comfortable. Well, guess what? It's because you're lacking oxygen. Then, second tier, a decrease in blood pressure and an elevation in heart rate. Okay, this is how it happens. First, restlessness and agitation. Got about 15 minutes. Then they're going to go to the second tier. And you're going to see a decrease in BP and then an increase in heart rate. You only got about 10 minutes here. Then you're going to get to pallor and clammy skin. When it gets to here, you have about 5 minutes to act. Within five minutes, they're going to go into code. And if you don't save them, within six minutes, once their heart stops beating, six minutes leads to brain death. And once your brain is dead, you are dead. So we have about how long to react? About three minutes. Tops. Tops. 
That's why we have to get them here. Because if we don't get them here, this to this is no time at all. Okay. When it comes to smoking and stress, we release catecholamines. Catecholamines are epinephrine and norepinephrine. So this makes us really amped up and hyper. Well, also what it does is it's a vasoconstrictor. So it's strangling our vessels and now it's shooting our blood pressure through the roof. That's why we're Superman. That's why we run around. That's why we have extra strength when we have excessive catecholamines in our system. When we smoke, it compounds that. So when we're smoking and stressed out, we have hypertension due to what? The vasoconstriction because of the epinephrine and the nicotine, all right? And that's it, because the next page we're gonna go over next week. Cool, we got it? Questions, concerns, comments? No, we're good? I'm glad to see you here. You. You signed in on the list on Tuesday, correct? Okay. Mm -hmm.